Hi, my name is Erin Dunn, and I'm the Associate Curator of Modern and Contemporary Art at Telfair Museums. I'm so excited to be leading you through a tour of Complex Uncertainties, Artists in Postwar America. This exhibition opened at Telfair Museums in 2016, and it's an ongoing installation that features modern and contemporary art from Telfair Museums' permanent collection. The art featured in this exhibition explores American artistic achievement from 1945 to the present day. And in addition to outlining some of the major artistic movements from the mid 20th century to today, the exhibition looks at how historic events have challenged artists to construct narratives, explore unknowns, and react to power. Contemporary art by its very nature um, is art that responds to its present moment. So in this exhibition, you'll see how American artists have been responding to specific historical events. And artists have always been on the forefront of representing how history is lived. And this exhibition remains relevant today as artists are responding to our present moment. You as a viewer are really kind of part of this exhibition in that many of the works allow various points of access and offer um, individual meanings that you can form from the works. Um, and I'm, this is not a static exhibition. We're constantly changing out works in the exhibition. So while you may come back and see works that you've loved from the beginning, we'll also add in new works later that will um, expand upon certain themes in the exhibition. So you'll always be able to see something new. Um, and now I'll be able to highlight a few specific works from the exhibition exhibition for you. So the work I'm standing in front of currently is Louise Nevelson's Mirror Shadow 23 from 1986. This work, as you can see, is a rather large-scale assemblage of uh, mixed-media works that have been constructed together and painted black to form this really dynamic composition on the wall. Louise Nevelson was born in 1899 in Ukraine and moved to New York City in 1920 and attended the Art Student League in 1929 um, and really didn't have her big kind of breakthrough um, working on the series she's probably best known for, these black wooden assemblages until 1950s or so. Um, and she really started working with this material because she couldn't afford traditional art materials at the time. So she was foraging in her Manhattan neighborhood and finding you know, bits of baseball bats and architectural ornaments and then combining those um, into uh, these constructions. And then to kind of unify those works, she was painting them one color. And for her, she often uh, used the color black because it contained a wholeness, it contained all, she said. Um, and she was making these works and they were really different from what people thought that um, female artists should be making at the time. So she was really challenging a lot of narratives um, that were being put forward at, in the day. Um, and she really remains one of the preeminent artists and one of the most influential artists of the 20th century. So the work that we're looking at now is this large scale acrylic on canvas piece by the artist Sam Gilliam. Um, as you can tell, this is another work that kind of challenges the idea of what's sculpture and what's painting. Sam Gilliam was one of the most innovative artists of the 20th century. He really kind of carries the legacy of abstract expressionism and is often associated with the Washington Color School. His kind of big moment came in the 60s when he saw women hanging clothes um, out on a clothesline. And he thought, well, if I can take the canvas off of its traditional stretcher form, maybe I can kind of innovate in new and creative ways by saturating the canvas and hanging it from the ceiling and draping it from the wall. Um, so those are works that we're very familiar of seeing from Sam Gilliam. This particular work is from a series he did called Chasers. Um, it was a 17 part series. And usually those canvases had kind of um, feature at the right corner that was then balanced out by um, other pieces in the, in the composition. It was a nine-sided canvas um, that also featured these kind of beveled edges around the corner. Um, this particular work, many people often comment on its kind of tar-like or asphalt-like um, appearance. It's really just this intense buildup of acrylic paint on the surface that creates this really thick impasto um, that really makes a really wonderful textural element to the work. This is a painting by the American artist Joseph Konopka titled Television, um, painted in 1970, which if you can't read that from the label, you could also notice um, on the painting itself. 
Uh, so Joseph Kanopka was um, an artist who really worked in the photorealist style, covering a variety of subject matters. He worked for a while as an army illustrator and then spent most of his career um, as a scenic artist for late night television, including Late Night with David Letterman and Late Night with Conan O'Brien. This work is really a wonderful piece that really comments on the zeitgeist of American culture and society at the time. Um, when he painted it in 1970 was the time that color television was really coming to the forefront. Um, and it was a time when Americans began to say that they were getting more of their news from television than they were from newspapers. And that's really deftly demonstrated in this painting by the fact that this young woman sitting in front of the television has a newspaper on her lap um, that's kind of being discarded and she's turning to the television and turning the knob to CBS Channel 2. And CBS was really kind of having a heyday. Um, there, uh, Walter Cronkite was the anchor at the time and was really gaining a lot of coverage for um, his news about the Vietnam War and the space race. And CBS had just had their highest ratings ever after the live transmission of um, the astronauts walking on the moon in 1969. So this piece really kind of comments on all of that information and technology that was coming to the forefront at that moment. And in addition, it's just a really interesting painting in and of itself with this really muted palette that Joseph Kanopka uses, as well as this entertaining framing device which echoes the television and also kind of looks like a slide transparency and really puts it in that moment of the 1970s. And this is also one of those really wonderful works that for many years was in storage in our um, permanent collection and we were able to bring out as part of this exhibition and it's really become a fan favorite. We're currently looking at an untitled painting by the American artist and professor Murray Reich from 1976. Um, Murray Reich was a professor at Bard College for over 25 years um, and also a very active painter. He liked to work um, in series and he considered a canvas a problem waiting to be solved. So he was really interested in finding these systems of order and inquiry that he could work within, um, very similar to kind of the ideas that Sam Gilliam was exploring in his works. So in this particular canvas, which is known as his Searchlight series, um, Murray Reich has placed four primary colors together um, and used put the pointillist technique, which was um, really popularized by the French artist Georges Seurat, and placed the dots at various distances from each other to create what appears to be different colors throughout the work um, and to make certain areas look white um, and certain areas um, look like those primary colors that they are initially. So it's really based on the distances of the dots. Um, and he wants the viewer to know that he is working with this um, illusion, but he also wants you to be taken in by it. So that's what's really wonderful about this canvas is that you can come up close and see these points and dots that he's working with that are tricking your eye and then move back and be awed by it. So we're currently looking at the painting Baseball Players by the artist Elaine de Kooning. This work is really focused on the movement and dynamism of the baseball players that are depicted in the work. Elaine de Kooning was a really influential artist, writer, and thinker of her time um, and was really associated with the abstract expressionist movement uh, and was known for being a correspondent for art news. Um, and she actually traveled with two baseball teams in the mid-1950s um, and really captured some wonderful moments. This is what looks kind of like a quick study. Um, you can see these moments where an arm is just indicated by a green brush stroke and it's really wonderful work to get up close and see how these um, single brush strokes kind of imitate an entire movement. So the work that I'm currently standing in front of is a lithograph on paper by the artist Romare Bearden titled Falling Star from 1979. Um, Romare Bearden was born in Charlotte, North Carolina, but moved with his parents to New York City when he was only three years old. However, he often spent summers with his grandparents um, back in the South. And for him, those memories and this nostalgia of the South often made references in his later work. 
Um, for many years, he worked as a social worker um, in addition to making his art kind of on the side and his reputation grew and grew as an artist. He was really well known for his collage and mixed media works, um, as well as being an active promoter of the work of young black artists. He was a founding member of the Harlem Museum or the Studio Museum in Harlem. And he really was active in promoting that, that work and activism. Uh, this work right here kind of shows an everyday domestic scene. Um, and you can see the affirm aforementioned um, falling star through the window in the background. And I just love kind of, you know, the simultaneous flatness of the work, but it also gives you layers and depths um, into the background where you can have this moment of domestic um, everyday scene, but then have that kind of mystical, magical quality evoked by the falling star. So today we're looking at a selection of photographs from a multi-year photo essay um, by the British photographer Keith Cardwell. Um, Cardwell moved to Savannah when he began working at the Savannah College of Art and Design in the mid-90s, and he was really fascinated by the community of people that he met at the First African Baptist Church, uh, which purports to be the first black Baptist congregation in North America. And so he created many wonderful kind of vignettes of the community, community that he saw there, um, of the choir, of church visits, um, of family, of baptisms. And it's really kind of wonderful moment in this exhibition where we can explore our regional um, community and look at some Savannah scenes that might be familiar to people. So the work that we're looking at currently um, is by the artist Nick Cave. It's a sound suit from 2012, and this work was featured in an exhibition that Telfair hosted in 2017 titled Nick Cave that featured a selection of his sound suits and videos. And so we were so happy that this work became part of the permanent collection after that exhibition. Um, as you can see, it's a really brightly um, sequined garment, and these garments were often meant to be worn and performed in, um, and Nick Cave documented that through video, um, but they can also be appreciated as these static artistic objects. Um, Nick Cave made his first sound suit in response to the Rodney King beating in LA, and after that he was feeling very kind of despondent about his place as a black man in America, and he looked down and he saw these twigs on the ground that looked as kind of forsaken as he was feeling, and he picked them up and he created this entire suit made of twigs that made this incredible sound when he moved um, that he could dance and perform in. And so for him, these sound suits became almost like a second skin that could conceal um, race, uh, gender, sexuality, class, and um, people wouldn't be able to judge you on the basis of any of those things. So it was really allowed him and people to transform their identities. Um, they also kind of take reference to costuming cultures um, and ceremonial traditions, um, carnival, masquerade, as well as African ceremonies. Uh, so they can, you can really have a lot of access points into these works. They're really wonderful.